fighters. What do fighters do? Fighters fight. But what do they fight? Uh, they fight fighters and bombers and ground attack craft. And you know what? They fight things. But only flying things. That's, the, that's what makes a fighter. And sometimes not flying things. And sometimes things on what? You know, you know what? We'll get to that in just a second. But we got to do some other stuff before we find out who made this first and what they do and what they shoot at. That's complicated. So we're going to move on. We're going to get to that. Who made the first fighter? Well, first we got to figure out what is a fighter? The question of what is a fighter is very important. So we have to define that very well and sincerely. What is a fighter? First, we need to know what a plane is. A fighter, after all, is a type of plane, a very specialized plane, excellent at killing very specific types of prey. So we're going to go into the very, very brief history of planes and where they came from. Well, do you know what a fighter is? First, you have to know what a plane is. What's a plane? Well, not to simplify too much, a plane is this cool little machine we got that makes it to where humans, a ground animal, can fly in the sky like a bird. You know, pretty cool, eh? But how did we do that? Well, we're going to get into this right now. We're going to get into the how and the why plane. Because we know what plane, but why and how plane. And that's going to tell us why and how and what fighter, right? All right. So a long time ago, a man watches a bird fly, and he goes, I want to do that. And what follows is a bunch of people trying and failing to fly until eventually two mad lads on December 7th, 1903, launched the first ever plane. That's cool. We can fly now. That's pretty revolutionary. Humans, ground creatures, we can fly in the air now. Amazing. And so we start making all kinds of cool planes. Now, militaries have used aircraft before. Even since the Napoleonic Wars and the U.S. Civil War as well, they've been able to put people in aircraft, not planes, but things in the sky for military purposes for quite a long time. What were they? They were balloons. Big balloons. Not that, t not that balloon. This balloon. Yes, that balloon. We put people in those type of balloons and they take pictures and they tell us what's going on because you can see for a while in a big balloon. There's a problem. It's big, it's flammable, and you can't move it. It stays there. And if it does move, you can't get it back. Like if you let go of the balloon and the dude starts floating away, you, he doesn't float back. Now the enemy have him or he floats into your rear. So you can't really move it unless you have a Zeppelin and that's big and expensive. And I think they did that once, but I'm not sure. So yeah, you put a brave, brave small man in a basket, balloon him up, and you just can't go anywhere. When planes came into the military, they decide, hey, look, it's like a balloon, but I can fly it to wherever the heck I want. I can have this. I fly. We put a dude in the back. He's got a camera. He takes photos. Now we've got better balloons. That's pretty cool. We can fly these things wherever we want. We can fo take photos of whatever the heck we want to, and nobody can stop us. It's such a novelty at the beginning of the First World War that uh, when enemy pilots would fly next to each other, they'd wave at each other. They'd be like, oh, look, another pilot. That's pretty cool. I think it's cool that I'm a pilot. We're flying around. This is new. This is cool. And World War One is muddy. It's soggy. It's deadly. Millions of people die. Half of the people that die in the war are civilians, around 20 million, and half of the people that die in actual battle don't die in battle, they die of disease. Really, really terrible time that nobody likes to be in. Nobody really likes it. But if you're a pilot, you don't have to sit in a trench for all the war. So that's kind of cool. That's a pretty cool gig. You do have to learn how to be a pilot, and you're flying the mo some of the most primitive planes to ever exist, so they fail pretty often, and that's the risk part. You don't become a pilot... I mean, if it wasn't risky, everybody would have been a pilot at that time. They'd learn how to fly, but learning how to fly and then flying, pretty stinking dangerous in these rickety little pod racers that you're flying around. But that's just a little fun fact. Anyway, now now we're going back to why and how fighters. It's not until the Battle of the... What, that's a French word. Marne, Maine, Marne, Maine. Uh, it's Mar, I'm going to say Marne. That's how it's pronounced now. It's Marne. They decide that these photographs are pretty great. I can see whatever the heck I want to look at. I can see where I should launch artillery. And they're all sitting in the room just chatting about. And they're chatting about it, of course. And one says, you know, it's really great we have this. If we didn't have this, our life would absolutely suck. Like, horrible. And they all wait for a second, just kind of nodding along until one of the generals says, I know who I want to have a terrible life. The enemy. So they decide they're going to start shooting these things down. 
Um, and this is how airplanes work at the time. You take a biplane or a monoplane, because mo the French and the Germans really like monoplanes around this time. You got a pilot, and you got an observer. And the pilot, he flies. Of course, he's a pilot, he flies. And the observer, he takes the photos, the very important part. And early on, the observers just brought a rifle. Now, the problem with bringing a rifle into a plane and trying to shoot at another plane, two moving, unpredictable objects are really stinking hard to hit with a rifle. And if you hit one, it's basically a giant canvas paper airplane. The bullet enters and leaves the other side and nothing changes. Hitting something important is super duper hard. Some militaries put machine guns with their observers on the back of the plane, and the observers, now they got a machine gun. You could probably actually shoot down an aircraft with that. Big problem though, uh, they're struts and propellers and, you know, important stuff that you're trying not to hit and you're in the center of the plane where you can hit all of it. It's not very good and machine guns at this time are ridiculously heavy. So now people decided we need to find a different way. There's gotta be an easier way. So in 1913, the British were the first to make fighter squadrons of FB-5 gun bus aircraft. What's that? So in a very British interwar period style of thinking, they decide to put the engine in pusher formation. For reference, a tractor propeller is on the front. Tractors pull things. And if it's on the back, it's a pusher. Because pushers, if you push something, you're pushing it. You know, pushers push things. That's what pushers do. You know, you know it's pretty hard to figure out what a pusher does, but it pushes stuff. Anyways, the British decide if we put a 60-pound Vickers gun on the front of this, and then we move the engine and the propeller to the back, if we're facing somebody, we don't hit the propeller. That's a great idea. Only there's one problem with that. You've got... Planes have to be light, right? 60 pounds of gun and metal directly on the front of your gun. Not a great thing for maneuverability. The FB-5 went into service because the FB-1, 2, 3, and I believe 4 were way too front heavy and crashed constantly. All of the time. Now they get to 5 and it doesn't crash as much. But it's super unmaneuverable. It's effectively... A, that's why they call it the gun bus. It's a slow bus with a machine gun on it. It's a, more of a fighting plane than a fighter. The first ones start arriving in 1914, and the pilots learned that you can't go up very fast, you can't turn very fast, and it's really hard to not crash. They do get some kills, however, mostly because of reconnaissance planes flying into their range on accident and then realizing, oh, they have machine guns. Other than that, a reconnaissance plane can just, you know, turn around, and there's nothing the gun bus can do about it. It got so bad that there was only one crew of all of these fighters, fighting planes, I should say, that had an ace crew. They were able to take down five or more aircraft. They really don't feel like fighters. Fighters, you think of them in your head, oh, those fast, well-maneuvering, sleek aircraft, the static guns on the front with enough firepower to down a Zeppelin, just putting on as much machine gun fire as you can to where they get to that right turning angle, they can just mow down whatever they're trying to kill. These things are very far away from that. Funnily enough, that's actually the exact reason that modern-day fighters don't really exist. The F-35 is more of a multi-role aircraft. If I do a, a video on modern air power in the future, I'll expand on that, regardless of what people like the reformers try to tell you, using a super maneuverable A-10 with the biggest gun on it and a bunch of armor and no tech is not super useful when your enemy has missiles. And, you know, missiles, you can shoot people with a missile further away you can with a gun. And with no radar... You can't really see where you're shooting at. You know, it's not a very good idea. Anyway, back to biplanes and the probably one of the most depressing wars that's ever happened in human history. So, the gun bus was the first idea of a fighting plane. Before the gun bus, there is, you shoot at people with a pistol, and that's even less effective than a gun bus. Unless you're a Russian. You know, the Russians in the war, they decided, well, we can't really mount a gun to a plane. So that means we can have weapons on our plane, and they thought, what if I turn my plane into a weapon? There was one fighter ace that was able to hook his own plane to enemy planes and would start bludgeoning enemy planes' pilots with his own landing gear. Really strange. Ramming became commonplace, and it became kind of a wild west in the skies. You know, kind of weird stuff, like <laughs> ramming people and bludgeoning people with landing gear. What comes next, after the gun bus is what I would argue is the first true fighter and that really captures what a fighter concept is all about. Now the problem is, if you mount a machine gun on the front of your plane, you fire it like a normal fighter. You imagine you line yourself up with the enemy, you pull the trigger, and you hear 
a sound kind of like a chainsaw as you've suddenly shot the propeller off the front of your plane and you crash into the ground, you go boom. People tried to do that. It became a, a small problem. You shoot your propeller off. No propeller. I mean, you did get an air to hair kill, but it's yourself and the ground is getting just a little too close. World Power start developing a gear to synchronize their machine guns with the propellers so they shoot at the same time. There's a big gap in the propellers where there's air. Propellers spin fast enough that you're probably going to hit the propellers unless you can time it for exactly for that gap. People start trying to do that even before the war. Now, a Dutch-born German engineer is credited with making the first synchronized gear for the German army and mounted on a Fokker E1 in 1915. These planes took to the air with the express purpose of air-to-air -air combat, and they were deployed en masse, creating the Fokker craze. Post-production links here. It's not the Fokker craze. It's the Fokker scourge. I completely forgot what it was when I was writing the script. Sorry, my apologies. Now, it looks like this is the first fighter. It, it quacks like a fighter. It walks like a fighter. It even shoots bullets like a fighter. And But I would argue that it's not. I'm going to dispute that and go against convention in a revolution. I mean, it's true, accepted history, but I'm going to fight anyways. Everybody agrees with me, but I'm still going to revolution anyways. Um, we're going to get into a man named Roland Garros. It's a French name. I could have pronounced it wrong. I probably did. Now, Mr. Roland here, he was an accomplished aviator before the war. Flying monoplanes, competing in races, setting altitude records. He set a record of around 13,000 feet after an Austrian aviator, Philip von Bar Blach, 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 Blach. You know, European names are weird. What is it, Austrian? Yeah, that's a weird name. Blach, I'm going to write it on screen. Read it right now. Stop doing what you're doing. Re read that. Blach for me. Read that. Not out loud, but that's what it is. Hard to pronounce. So, that aviator had flown to 14,000 feet just to say, hey, now I got the record. Roland didn't like this, and so he flew up to 18,000 feet. His record stayed there for just a little while, you know. Post-production links again. There wasn't enough evidence I found for the 20,000 feet mark, but... I did find confirmation that it at least got to 12,000 feet. So here's this at least this cool image of 12,000 feet. Still pretty stinking high up for one of those biplanes. 18,000 feet is no small feat at the time. He gained fame by making the first non-stop flight across the Mediterranean Sea. And when wor World War I broke out, he became a reconnaissance pilot flying the... Oh man, it's another French name. Escredil MS-26. I think I actually pronounced that correctly. Heck yeah, pat on my back, pat pat. Using a carbine, he tried to shoot down enemy aircraft, but couldn't actually hit anything. I mean, everybody tried to do that around that time. You know, I got my gun. How do I shoot at stuff? Well, now I can't hit anything. I don't know what he expected. Uh, you can't really put anything super important on 90% of those planes. And it, again, it's a big paper airplane. You need to save weight and space. So other than the engine, the fuel, and the pilot, you can't hit anything important. He visited the Moraine Solner work uh, in November of December 1914 to discuss the problem. Raymond Solner was already trying to make a synchronizer, and he had made a working prototype, but due to circumstances outside of his control, as usual, he had to use a Hotchkiss 0913. That gun hang-fired like most machine guns of the time pretty stinking often, and that means its rate of fire could not be predicted, that meaning the gear would be incorrect as the gun fires. That meant the rate of fire couldn't be predicted, meaning every time you shoot it, it could change the rate of fire a little bit. When it changes the rate of fire, the gear doesn't change with it. That makes the machine gun unsuitable as you're not shooting the propeller most of the time, but you're still blowing your propeller off your plane if you're firing the gun. Garrison Solner, with the help of his mechanic, Jules Hugh, which has no photos on the internet for some reason, they met in a room and they decided that it will hit the propeller sometimes and that would shoot the propeller off. Well, Jules Hugh, the mechanic, decided, well, what if we decide to make the propeller bulletproof? Everybody kind of looks at him and just goes, that's a pretty good idea. And so they strap some metal plates to the parts of the propeller that will get shot sometimes and their plane was flight worthy. I can really only imagine all three of them in the room debating on how to fix their problem. Probably something like this. This is how I imagine it in my head, at least. Just 
We know if we shoot the propeller off, we're gonna crash and die. We know the French, hold on. If we shoot the propeller off, they will uh, crash and they will die a horrible death. And you as the pilot do not want to die a horrible death, do you? No, me, <laughs> me not horrible death, no. <laughs> no, me horrible death, no, bad, 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 bad. And then you go to Jules, right, and Jules says, but what if we take the propeller and we make it bulletproof and everybody in the room just goes, that's a fantastic idea, wee wee, wee wee, wee wee, and then they have a baguette, they have some coffee, and they get to work. So they take the propeller, they mount it on his Moraine Solner Type L, parasol monoplane, he climbed in, waved goodbye, and Garrus flew off into the sunset. As the engineer watched his friend go off, he quietly wept as he knew he may not return alive. I don't actually know if any of that happened. I made that completely up. But Garrus achieved the first ever shooting down of an aircraft by a fighter using a tractor propeller where the bullets go through the propeller without actually hitting the propeller. Pretty big thing. That's kind of a, hey, look, new jump in technology. And the only problem with this is they only made one of them. He's basically flying a prototype. First of its kind, and I would argue, the very first fighter. In essence, the fighter concept of aiming the plane at an enemy and then firing guns at it. It doesn't necessarily have to be the propeller, but it's aimed by the plane, by the pilot. You don't have to have a gunner. I'm pretty sure, in my opinion, if you have to have a gunner to shoot at stuff, it's not a fighter. It's a fighting plane, but it's not a fighter. They only made one of them. Post-production and very tired links. Yes, I know they started mass producing them. Shush, shush, shush. There was one bill at the time. Shush, shush. It was a, it was like a Wonder Weapon prototype. You know the German Wonder Weapons of World War II? No, we got French Wonder Weapons. Yes, only one, only one French Wonder Weapon in this war. Well, there's probably more than that, but you know, it's a revolutionary new concept. There's only one of them, and Garrus flew the first one. I would probably cr credit his engineer with the one being like, "Hey." What if we put metal on the propeller so it doesn't break? Later, he would... It was on April 1st, 1915, April Fool's Day, um, that he got his first kill. He would later get three more kills before going down in German ter territory due to ground fire that took out his engine. When he landed, he attempted to destroy his plane. He managed to step it, set it on fire, but when the Germans captured him and his plane and put the fire out, both synchronization gear and... The propeller were re received intact. The German military then shipped that down to the Falker factories where they were trying to produce their own synchronization gear. They were trying to make their own fighter of this type. It's debated whether or not he copied the design of the synchronization gear or if he used his own or if it was a little bit of a both. I believe it was a little bit of a both. The Germans, using that design, made the Falker E1 and started the Fokker Scourge. Overall, the British design was the first ever fighting plane. The Fokker was the first mass-used, mass-produced fighter. But I believe Garros, in the end, flew the very first fighter. If you're hearing this, that means the video's over. Um, I just got done recording. It's, what, it's two o'clock? In the morning i haven't looked at the clock for a while i said i was gonna get this done in one sitting i'm never ever going to do that again but i did do it today i'm going to chug a ridiculous amount of coffee tomorrow uh, uh yeah i hope you liked the video if you were watching the video itself you probably noticed that a about probably the 12 minute mark the quality really started dropping and that's when i really started getting really tired <laughs> um but yeah here's the first content driven video i'm planning on doing about two more small one story type things like maybe five minutes long um before i do another one about this long and that's kind of going to be the content loop for a little while Um, I should probably mention the first video. So the first one was just a channel, uh, trailer. It has currently gotten me a, what, three plus, hold on, let me, let me, let me look at it. Let me, I like getting up-to-date numbers. 
So it's got, oh my goodness gracious. So let's look at the analytics for this thing. One second. 77 views, 9 likes, 15 comments, and it's netted me around uh, 3 plus 5, so that's 8 subscribers. That's more than I could have really ever hoped for that video to happen. If I wake up in the morning, it's got a 100 views on it, and I'm going to... I don't know what the crap I'm going <laughs> to... I never prepared for this type of stuff. Um, Yeah. So that's the end of this one. I really hope you liked it. Because I had a whole lot of fun making it, except for the editing part, because editing hurts. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the support I've been getting from that one. And I really look forward to making more videos. Kind of like this one. You know, it's a fun thing to explore a topic. Uh, you probably noticed that I went through the same bit of footage like a billion times because I didn't have time to record extra footage. And it's definitely going to be a multi-day project next time instead of being like, wake up in the morning and upload at night because that's way too much to crunch into one thing. I'm learning. I'm learning these things. Um, yeah, if you liked it, you know, do the stuff. Like, subscribe, ring the bell comment you know even if you think it was a terrible video because then more people can see the terrible video and make fun of me or if you think it was good more people can say i was good you know it makes me want to do more videos but yeah i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those people that started subscribing on that other video if that video had tanked i probably would have never gotten this one out so yeah this has been a video about the first fighter pilot and the first fighter, and planes, and other nonsense. Um, I really want to do a video on the reformers soon, and mostly modern conflict in Ukraine, because modern conflict is my bread and butter. It's kind of the most interesting thing, because you have to learn recent things, and as they're, you know, like, breaking news, and trying to filter through the propaganda, and what's true and what's not in that type of place, but, yeah. I'll see all of you in the next video. Have a very, very good day. Thank you very much for watching. And yeah, have a fantastic night, evening, or whatever.